Hello and welcome to the third episode of the History Show on Near 90 FM. My name is Cahal Brennan and in the first half of the programme, John Dorney will be interviewing Professor Eunan O'Halpian about the dead of the Irish Revolution project, which seeks to determine for the first time how many people were killed in the Irish Revolution of 1916-1923. The Dead of the Irish Revolution by Eunan O'Halpian and Dahi O'Koran will be published in 2012. In the second half of the show, I will be talking to Eve Morrison about her research work in the Bureau of Military History in Dublin. The Bureau contains interviews with activists who were involved in the War of Independence and the Civil War. If you want to listen to this or previous episodes of The History Show, go to the Near FM podcast page on www.nearpodcast.org. You know, Halpin, you're working on the project The Dead of the Irish Revolution. Can I ask you to explain a little bit about the project and what drew you to the project in the first place? Well, the aim of the project, in some way, what seems a very simple thing, which is to work out how many people died as a result of Irish political violence. Uh, between uh, with this volume between January 1919 and December 1921, now it seemed simple. It turns out to be very complicated to get a, to get a precise figure to determine in many instances where deaths really uh, linked directly to political violence and so on are not because of it, the inadequacy of many records. All sorts of technical things like the same name being spelled differently in different sources, the flawed memory of many people because of biased documentation where there is any. It's often quite hard, but it's been very challenging, but we now have a rough, roughly robust figures, like by, by, divided by county for that period. Um, what kind of sources would you use to, to determine the figure? Well, an obvious source, an important source, particularly for, for local historians and so on, is newspapers. But newspapers then, as now, are themselves quite problematic, particularly as regards issues like spelling, Sometimes they report somebody who's wounded, but in times of intense conflict, there are so many people wounded that sometimes they'll go on to say that they're dead. That's particularly so for military casualties, for example. A soldier might be gravely wounded in Roscommon. By the time he dies, a couple of weeks later, you know, the Roscommon newspapers moved on to other tragedies and so on. That's one problem. There's other problems which arise from, for example, where somebody may die and the family have always maintained that it was directly as a result of being in prison, for example. Uh, indeed, my own grandfather from, from County Down ultimately died of disease, which the family always maintained he, he had got by one of his periods of internment or whatever. Uh, but in that case, it was he died you know, 21 years, 22 years after the last time he'd been in prison. So it's, in some ways, it'd be absurd to count him as a fatality, even though in the family narrative, his death is linked directly to what he experienced. There is also problems to do with determining who the people who die are. It's relatively easy to work out who policemen are, uh, regular policemen and soldiers and so on, because by and large they have regimental numbers or they have service numbers and, and so on, and their deaths are, are generally relatively well documented. It's extremely difficult, however, in regard to one category of soldier, which is to say soldiers who were picked up by the IRA and say they are deserters, of whom there's a good number, particularly in County Cork. And in that case, the military may never count them as killed. They may count them as missing or more likely as deserters. In many cases, they probably were deserters. Uh, whereas from the IRA perspective, uh, they very often capture these people, decide to kill them, kill them, bury them. And sometimes there's no trace of these people left. Mm-hmm. On the civilian side, it's generally but not always possible to be sure of who killed who. It's most difficult in, in Belfast City where you've got a lot of sectarian violence and a lot of shooting on a sectarian basis. Somebody shoots down a Catholic street, God knows who they hit. Somebody shoots down a Protestant street, God knows who they hit. And in those cases, it's very hard to know because there's a lot of crossfire who is responsible for particular deaths. Mm-hmm. And these deaths matter. You know, these, it may be Mary Murphy, whom no one outside the family remembers now, but they matter to individual families just as much as the deaths big IRA figures are of, you know, Field Marshal Wilson, June 1922 or whatever. Every death counts for somebody. I just got an email at the weekend from a woman in England looking for details of the burial of her grandfather. Now, by extraordinary coincidence, her grandfather, who was an Irish black and tan, was killed outside Tipperary Town on the 13th of November 1920. Now, that ambush was organised by my grandfather, who did the intelligence for it. His brother, Con Maloney, was one of the senior brigade officers and so on. So you have a link there immediately between a descendant of somebody who helped to do the deed and a descendant of somebody who's simply trying to find out what happened to her grandfather and where he's buried. Mm-hmm. And we usually split the Irish Revolution, as we're calling it these days, into three chapters, like the Easter Rising, the War of Independence and the Civil War. Does the project take in all of those phases 
Uh, yeah, it, it does. 1916, in some ways, stands out as a separate kind of conflict. For example, there was no killing of informers in 1916. An awful lot of civilians who die in 1916, basically in quite indiscriminate shooting, and particularly shooting and shelling. It's very hard, a lot of the time in 1916, to determine uh, who's, by whose agency somebody died. And I think I need to, we need to do more research on 1916 generally, even though the, the absolute figures are fairly well known. What are the figures for 1916? It's just under 500, mm. right? Of whom the great majority are, are civilians, and the great majority of, of all casualties there uh, occur in Dublin City. But to take the period thereafter, obviously the most intense period, period of violence is, is from the autumn of 1920 until July 1921, but the guns don't stop firing uh, with the truce for death continue, and it's not only deaths where, for example, the RAC continue to be targeted, still killing in, in the north, or what has become Northern Ireland. But you also have accidental deaths arising from, you know, because the IRA are still training, the military are still there. A lot of soldiers get killed by accidents, guns going off and so on. And a fair few uh, IRA men also get killed in that way or by grenades exploding. After the truce, the IRA is still is trying to build up and train and train. And therefore, it's opportunities for accidents happen. And also the a, a certain academic in some, in some areas and a certain willingness to pursue grudges, if you like, against Crown forces is still there. So, so Ireland remains a reasonably violent place. To the end of my study, which is December 21, it continues in that vein of sporadic and sometimes quite serious violence in the early months of 1922, leading up to, obviously, to the uh, the outbreak of civil war at the end of June. Mm -hmm. And do you have a, a round number for the War of Independence? My count of fatalities is about 2,141 obviously going to be only perhaps 97 or 8 percent right. I don't think I've included deaths which shouldn't be included but there may be some deaths I've missed. For example in Cork it's clear in 1921 that a good number of people, I guess it could be as high as 30, simply don't appear in the records. They appear sometimes in IRA narratives that spy was caught and executed, our British soldier caught and executed and body buried but they were never listed formally as missing. The same for some civilians and they just have disappeared. And I know this controversy, particularly Jared Mur Murphy's very interesting 2010 book, The Year of Disappearances, has caused a lot of controversy. But I think the underlying point that Jared makes, which is that a number of people, other than those we know about, were plainly taken by the IRA or by Republicans and killed and their bodies disposed of, and those bodies have never been found. And in many cases, these people were never sought. And we also have the, the question of the problem where we do find bodies. There are a number of killings. There's one, for example, in Dundrum in early 921. A man is found shot dead. He looks like a pretty, an ex soldier. He underpants of a Welsh regiment on him, amongst other things. He has 10 shillings hidden in his sock. And, and nobody ever identifies him. There were a lot of unemployed males wandering around Ireland, as there was Britain itself at that time, typically ex soldiers, very often disconnected from their families and so on. And some of these. Not all ex-soldiers, males of that type, got killed by somebody or other. Mm. And some, so even when the bodies are found, you can't be sure who killed them. It's suspected in a few cases it mightn't be to do with the war at all. For example, a Norwegian seaman is found shot dead in the Keys in Cork, Mayor, June 1921. And it's been impossible to say who shot him, because I found no suggestion in any IRA records or accounts. There's nothing in Crown Forces or City. In May and June 21, by then the Crown Force were pretty indisciplined, especially the auxiliaries, as we know, and they may well have just come across them, some drunken sailor and shot them. We have a number of 2,100 for the War of Independence. How does that break down in terms of civilians and IRA and British forces? In total, about 48% of those fatalities could be called civilian. In that total of civilian, uh, there'll be some whom uh, Republicans especially will say were shot as spies and forms. It's not that many. But broadly speaking, you're looking at, at just over half who could be roughly classified as combatants to say that they were members of the army, of the IRA, of the RIC or, or the Dublin police, although they weren't armed, or the auxiliaries in black and tans. The proportion of civilian deaths is highest probably in Antrim. We forget about Belfast, but in fact it's part of the story and it's a very violent place. In terms of who was killing civilians, was it the IRA, was it the British forces, or was it rioting in Belfast? What accounts for most of the civilian deaths? In many cases, it's very hard to say. The British military and police kill a lot of civilians, quote, while attempting, attempting to run away, mm -hmm. or while attempting to escape, perhaps over a hundred. These are ones they acknowledge, 
and which are subject to a very cursory military legal process which determines that in almost all cases that the military were justified in firing because the person refused to, to halt. But it, within that category, for example, the undisputed category, there are eight or nine people who are deaf, and that's accepted why they died. They simply didn't hear challenges. They weren't in the IRA or whatever. There was a girl, a deaf Protestant woman in Belfast, for example, shot by military patrol because she repeatedly failed to heed an order to stop during a curfew, but she was deaf in the stone. Mm-hmm. So you have these curious categories and things. Amongst people shot for failing to hold, the army shoots a good few soldiers. For example, there's a soldier probably drunk coming back into the grounds of the Royal Hospital in Kilmain on Christmas Eve 1920. And according to the century, he, you know, he gave him a warning, gave him another warning, he just kept coming across the fields. Bang, he gets shot dead. There are two soldiers shot climbing back into the barracks in Galway. They'd obviously slipped out for a drink. They didn't want to come back to the gate. They get over the wall, a young sentry, and most of the sentries are very young, and they're in fear above all, you know, of the sergeant. And the sergeant, and the sentry fires a warning, nothing happens, fires another. Then she goes bang, bang, and shoots the two of them. He was doing his duty. It, it has to be accepted in many cases. The, the military or police simply shoot recklessly uh, or deliberately to kill people. In many others, they shoot following their own protocols. The protocol may have been wrong or inadequate. But you get this whole spectrum of reasons why people, or in a sense, innocent people die. Most people will probably know the Bloody Sunday in Dublin in November 1920 when there's a, a pretty large-scale reprisal killing of civilians in Crow Park. Is that really unusual or is there parallels to that? There are some parallels, but I think that both what happens on Bloody Sunday morning is unique, right, in its aims as much as in its, its achievements. And what happens on the afternoon of Bloody Sunday is also unique in its scale and in the absolute lack of discipline at uh, the very best of, of, of the British forces in Grove Park in, in opening fire and continuing to fire. The curious thing about Dublin is, although you know it's taken as the, as the great victory in the intelligence war, which I personally think is problematic, British intelligence got better after Bloody Sunday, it didn't get worse. But the point is that so many people were targeted, such an ambitious uh, operation uh, is itself you know, very interesting and it's, in fact it's unique. But the second thing about Dublin people might realise is that relatively very few alleged spies and informers were shot other than on Bloody Sunday in Dublin. It's in Cork in particular that you get a lot of people of varying degrees of plausibility being killed as spies. In kind of county like Offaly, where the number of deaths in Offaly is I think about 20 or 20, about 21, but in Offaly uh, the attempts of it is killed I think by the IRA of whom about six, I think, are alleged informers, which is a very high proportion, about 60%. The curious thing is that Dublin is not remotely, in a sense, as, as spy-crazy mm. uh, as is Cork. In Belfast, I don't think there's a single informer killed. It's mm. a curious film, that's in terms of Republican killings. In terms of killings of civilians, uh, in Dublin you get a good few civilian deaths arising from crossfire, mm-hmm. right, from ambushes, grenades being thrown and so on as you do to a lesser extent in Cork City. So civilians die for all sorts of reasons rather than they're simply targeted. How about combatants if we have, say, 52% then are, are combatants? So do they die like in action? Do they die in combat? Or do they die uh, assassinated? Or do they die in accidents? Combatants die in, in a variety of ways. The British military, for example, lose about 283 or 284 fatalities that I have counted from 1919 to 1921. That's the British Army now, not the York. Yes, the British British military. Of of them, uh, the astonishing thing is that it looks like just over a quarter, 26%, they die either accidents on their own side, accidental shootings, in rows about women, a few guys, you know, fire, shoot each other, Mm -hmm. traffic accidents, right, a few die that way. Over a quarter, just over a quarter of British military fatalities, as far as I can see, die, but not at enemy hands. When you look at the comparable figures, police, uh, both the RAC and, and the Black and Tans and Auxiliaries, you put them all together for this, you're looking at about 13%. Right? Less. Much less. Yeah. We have to speculate about this. That, and of that 13%, a good few die in, in road accidents because they, they had lorries and cars and they drove very often, particularly in dangerous areas, they drove at speed. There were, there were I think, four police killed in a single crash outside Drumolan Castle in Clare, which is a pretty dangerous place where you drove very fast, and they hit a bad curve and over it went. And the IRA had no motor transport, so they don't have that hazard, other than occasionally prisoners are thrown out of lorries or whatever. But by and large, they don't die in road accidents. And the IRA figure, like fatalities inflicted by their own side, are caused by whatever reason 
uh, would be about 9%. Mm -hmm. so there's, there are some reasons why that would be smaller than the police. One is they IRA had very few weapons. People forget this. So there's much less chance of accidental shooting and training. Most of their training was done without weapons, right? And where they did have weapons, they very often didn't have ammunition, right? Mm -hmm. So that comes into it. They may also have been in some ways more disciplined. The IRA relatively used a good few men to explosions, oh. not caused by, by their enemies, but caused by particularly manufacturing explosives. I think there were five men killed in, in a single incident in, in Wexford, for example, where they're manufacturing explosives and boom. In Croom and Limerick, I think three men die in Croom Courthouse while they're burning it down because they weren't used to petrol as a fuel. They were using it. And the point about petrol as compared with paraffin, which they were used to, mm. is that petrol produces a gas. So in other words, you get a, if you ever, as I at one stage, you get a whoosh. Yeah. And in terms of the ones killed by the enemy at the reader side, are, are we looking at the idea of ambushes, of combat, of firing, or are we looking at assassinations and dead squads and this idea? Crowd forces kill a lot of people, not in ambushes, but in, I suppose, attempted arrests and so on. Similarly, the IRA, the IRA would kill a lot of police in ambushes, clearly. Mm -hmm. But there's also a fair amount of what I've called, you know, assassination of one mm -hmm. kind or another. Important to stress, though, that even in, say, Cork, which was very violent, by and large, soldiers off duty in Cork City even were, were more or less safe. In Dublin, they were very safe. There were very few soldiers killed off duty in Dublin, even though they were soldiers. They weren't, if you like, legitimate targets and so on. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of nuances. There's probably a lot of local nuances as well. If we, we need local historians to probe these figures in my analysis and to challenge it, no doubt. And if you take the police and the RIC, who totally, in a sense, bore the brunt of Republican attacks and did a lot of the reprisal killing, especially, and, and the back of towns and all that. In some areas, the police lost almost no man. You know, I think at Leash there might be, I don't think there's a single police fatality during the War of Independence. In about 10 counties there's not a single military fatality. But it's a very geographically disparate series of violence. That's not to say that these weren't violent counties in the sense of, of police and military raids and of, of Republican activities falling short of killing. To take a very quiet county, Wigan, which has, has less than 10 fatalities, I think it's 7, okay? And of those seven fatalities, three arise from one incident where a justice of the peace, his house is burgled. And he would you think he'd be a natural target for the IRA, but it's burgled by two newly arrived black and tans who are drunk. There's a struggle. One of them shoots him. The two tans go back to their station where one of them kills himself. The other tries to beat the rat, but is, is sentenced to death and is executed in June 1921. So three out of the seven are from a single incident in which Republicans played no hand act or part, but resulted in two police deaths and one civilian death. So Wicklow was really very, very quiet. Now, did it? Wicklow Republicans did other things to contribute, you know, to the national struggle, but for whatever reason, they almost nobody, nobody in Wicklow dies. I think, yeah, that's a good point that, you know, the fact that some places were very violent and some places weren't so violent doesn't mean that nothing happened in the other places. No, no, not at all. And, and if, if you were... I mean, to take another quiet county, very different kind of place than, than Wicklow Cavan, which is, you know, very rural and so on. There's, I've counted, I think, nine fatalities in Cavan, which is nobody would call a big number. Yet Cavan people have a narrative of police raids and military raids. They have a narrative of the IRA. They also have a narrative of loyalists. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a narrative, to some extent, of, of uh, the UBF and so on, being, yeah. being active and being present. But Cavan wasn't necessarily a peaceful, quiet place, but it, it wasn't a place that produced a lot of attack, uh, either on or by the security forces or by Republicans, it produced a lot of death. Mm -hmm. well, that brings me to my next question, uh, which is, some counties, we know, not many people were killed. Where do people die in the Irish Revolution of that, about 2,000 people? They die in Cork, they die in, they die in Dublin, they die in Antrim. Antrim, in fact, is the highest number of civilian deaths, Antrim really means Belfast, mm -hmm. over 90% of, of, of fatalities there are civilian. Right. In Cork, it's about 170 from nearly 500. So, so 500 in total in Cork? Yeah, just under 500, mm -hmm. about 170 civilians. So it's a much more violent war, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, where a lot of civilians are killed, and a lot of them are killed in targeted killings far more security forces and IRA die. Mm -hmm. okay. So you've got a Cork, Belfast and Dublin? And Dublin, yeah. 
in Dublin, just over 300, I think it's about 320 in Dublin, maybe a little less. About a third of deaths in Dublin are civilians. Dublin and Cork and even Belfast get a slight, terrible term to use, but a slight premium because people are often brought from elsewhere to Dublin to have big hospitals to, to, for care and to die. So, for example, there's a policeman shot in Cavan, but he dies in Dublin, so we count him as a Dublin fatality. So the, but this, is, this only accounts for you know maybe 1% of all deaths, but this anomaly arises. Before even the Civil War, there was some violence between nationalists. If you read the newspapers, you'll see, between the truce and the outbreak of civil war, you have 11 months, or more than 11 months. You know, the guns don't stop firing. The place gets much quieter. Step aside from Northern Ireland and the issues there, and conflagration that arises from time to time there. In what becomes the free state, you have, first of all, the emergence of effectively two contending forces, the division of government forces, what becomes the National Army, and you have the, have the IRA, the anti, what becomes the anti-treaty IRA. And secondly, because you have a lack of law and order, because the police are gone, and for all the claims that you know, Republican police can keep order. But you very often, because parts of the country that haven't been very violent during the War of Independence, you do get, if you like, an element of, of disorder arising from the fact that there's lots of guns around, and there doesn't seem to be any enforceable law, and the people, the people groups of young men start taking what they want. You have a series of raids, I'm just thinking near where my, my dad grew up, around Letterkenny. Uh, there's obviously an armed group. In the end, two of them are shot by a farmer who into a house as they break, but they seem to have broken into a number of houses, killed one or two people before and after Christmas 1921. They don't seem to be political. I claim this political at all. In Leitrim, you have gangs who come down from the hills like outlaws almost. You have this general, in a sense, problem of indiscipline or civic indiscipline, whatever you want to call it. Certainly what the press regard, local press, as a continuation of disorder in many places. Westmead, the Mullingar gets quite rough for a time, for example. And Mullingar had been a pretty sleepy hollow during the War of Independence. So the disappearance of Crown Forces and the RIC, and perhaps because of differences between the, the, the what become the pro and anti treaty camps, nobody's really checking that the pubs are closing, mm-hmm. nobody's guarding the post office, and so on. And so you get sort of armed petty crime. Mm-hmm. And the project hasn't finished looking at the Civil War numbers yet, is that right? No, and I think that's going to be a huge challenge. The records for, for the War of Independence are problematic, but at least there are quite a lot of them. For the Civil War, I think it's going to be very hard. The more I look at it, the harder it gets. We know that for the War of Independence, the press is useful. It's seldom very accurate, even at local level. And it's in the Civil War with, where you press censorship, where you, communications are even harder than the, during the War of Independence. In some places, they may, people may not have kept records and people may not have observed death. It, it's going to be very difficult. Would your sense be that the final number is in and around the same as the War of Independence or no or higher? Well, it's generally held that it's higher. Seems to be higher. Yeah, and it's over a shorter period. I mean, there are figures for the National Army, I say the Free State Army, but they're clearly incomplete. Mm -hmm. Figures compiled by chaplains, for example. Uh, Michael Hopkinson, who did the first big study of the Civil War, has produced some figures, but he would say himself these are very provisional. Mm -hmm. The Republican side, similarly, and the civilian side, where there's lots of civilians. It's ironic we focus on the 77 executed by the government, or the government who forced, we know, killed perhaps 150, perhaps 200 people. Other than that, what we now regard as extrajudicial, almost as murder, we don't know how many Republicans killed. We know they killed loads of people, loads of civilians. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done there. Community history and family memory and so on is terribly important because you can't do it all from Dublin. Mm-hmm. So for the whole period, if you take it from 1916 to 23, you're looking at maybe about 5,000? Deaths, something like that? No, I'd say you're looking at more. More, okay. Yeah. But you see, some of these deaths are problematic. You have a handful of Republicans, for example, who are in prison in 1919, 1920, who die of influenza. Mm-hmm. Now, I have included them because they were in prison and they got it. The population as a whole gets completely, as we know, swamped by influenza in uh, 1918, 1919. So, killings of women, where they look as though there's a person or a sexual motive, right? Usually jealousy. They're very hard to pin down. When Crown Forces are accused of this, in the few cases, there's more likely to be an investigation and prosecution of, of the supposedly accidental shooting of a woman than a man, right? Particularly if she's in company of solitary, company of, of a soldier or a policeman. I think even there, there's more work to be done. For example, I was in court last week looking at the court examiner. <laughs> 
and there's a photograph of an ex-soldier in his uniform who's just been found, who's been shot dead. The family probably put it in, but they don't add the story, and the story, which is pretty clear and uncontested, is that he was caught in the act of raping a girl by an off-duty British soldier who challenged him and then shot him. And the girl gives pretty graphic evidence and so on. Mm -hmm. But but if you weren't careful, you'd describe his death as an ex-soldier. That's probably another IRA killing. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in fact, he's shot by an off-duty NCO as they tried to violate this young girl. The photograph, putting the photograph of him in, in his uniform is whether to liberty or not. You know, it would mislead you to thinking that he had died because he had served his king and country. But one of the things that comes across when you talk about the project is that this kind of conflict especially blurs the lines between crime and war and all these kind of concepts. So how does a society recover? How does it get back to normal to a non-violent state? This is the amazing thing. Really, early 1924 on, uh, the gun the kind of disappears from Irish politics and the gun as an accoutrement for robbery because of loads of guns, guns everywhere, they just uh, it just kind of disappears. It's very striking how quiet Ireland becomes. I'm not exactly sure when, but certainly by the end of 24, Ireland is no longer the Wild West. Agrarian disputes and so on, people fighting outside pubs and all that kind of thing. But, you know, they're using their fists or they're using slash ups or whatever, but they're not using the abandoned weapons or anything like that. Why do you think that is? Because a lot of places, of course, that doesn't happen. I know, absolutely. It's, it's a mystery. It's a profound mystery. I mean, it, it indicates a strong societal desire for the place to calm down and, and a kind of societal intolerance for continuing armed violence. And my grandfather was captured in March 23. He got out in August 24. He got married two months later. So maybe there's an effect, of, certainly amongst activists, you know, there were 11,000 Republicans or so interned. A lot of them, my, my granny's brother, was interned in the north uh, for two years. He gets out of the, the Christmas Eve 24, he goes to America. And perhaps a lot of the, a lot of people have been activists, mm. either, either and or got married or whatever, you know, who start, try to start their lives. Kevin Higgins in particular was worried not simply by Republicans, but the idea of social disorder and the lower mm -hmm. and bad elements in society getting guns and using violence and refusing to pay pay their bills and all this kind of stuff. He had a wider sense of society falling apart. But that proves to be utter nonsense. You know, bills get paid, even land agitation almost disappears in most, most of Ireland. And uh, the place becomes a very quiet, poor, backward new state, but not a violent place at all. The people who had done this killing, um, did it affect them? Were they haunted by it? Or did they just settle down in this, what turned out to be a peaceful society afterwards? I think that the answer to that varies. I, I read recently a very striking reference written by Sean Lamas in 1942, I think, for a man called Charlie Dalton. Now, Charlie Dalton was pro-treaty like Lamas. His associates murdered Lamas's brother in the Civil War. Well, after the Civil War, actually. But Lamas writes a very interesting and quite long uh, kind of freehand account of Charlie Dalton in, in November 1912, Bloody Sunday. And he says, look, this guy was very young. We felt he was too young to be with us. He was shaking beforehand. He was absolutely devastated afterwards. He kept hearing, telling us to turn off a tap, which is gurgling, because it reminded, you know, it reminded of something he'd heard that day. That's a really strong account of somebody who was never the same. You know, last said he was never, he never got over it. And Charlie Dalton was himself involved in the Red Cow murders for three young fellas. Who were, who were doing nothing but putting up posters, were taken out, ultimately shot the red cow. So he's a bad boy, if you like. Probably the one of you. I thought it was very generous of the mass to write a reference for him. But for everybody, like, anyone like that, I, I met lots of those Republicans. And most of them, as far as I can see, were no more scarred by killing our people trying to kill them than the ordinary run of people who were, obviously, sure, some of them, their hands shook, some of them probably had drink problems, some of them had nightmares. So did the general civilian population. I think we overdo, and it's going to get worse, we overdo this idea of, of, of kind of shell shock and trauma and how it works out as a kind of pathology in people's lives thereafter. Most of the Republicans I knew who killed people and so on, you know, they kind of regretted it, but they weren't apologizing and they didn't, as they didn't let the shakes. And say, same on the, on the free state side. You can see this free state at times pursued the IRA with great ferocity at local level. Sometimes they'd let their mates off, sometimes they wouldn't. But you know, people, men and even women can, can kill and arrange killings and say, well, that was, you know, there was a war and that was my duty. We have to get over the idea that everybody 
is equally shocked by the idea of killing a fellow human being in inverted commas legitimate circumstances. The same in Northern Ireland, and without being uh, mentally scarred thereafter or visibly scarred in, in, in any sort of behavioural way. Hello, my name is Carl Brennan, and you're listening to Near Ninety FM. This week, I'm very pleased to be joined in studio by Eve Morrison. Eve is a postgraduate student who is completing her PhD thesis in Trinity College Dublin. Eve, welcome to the program. Thanks. What is the Bureau of Military History and why was it set up? Okay, well, the Bureau of Military History was basically set up by the Irish government under the auspices of the Department of Defence um, to collect interviews and original documents from survivors of the War of Independence or veterans of the War of Independence that would be uh, ex-members of the IRA, uh, Cumann de Mon, the Irish Citizen Army, people who'd fought in, in the Easter Rising and the War of Independence. Um, and basically it was, I mean, there was a number of d- different um, ideas and projects floating around from right about the time, you know, from, say, just before the Second World War. And then, I, you know, for obvious reasons, um, they they really got going after, after the, the end of the emergency. And um, there was a number, of, you know, there's a writer, Ernie O'Malley, who was an ex-IRA man. He was... Uh, started his own project interviewing veterans say uh, it's they we think now we haven't quite pinned it down now but it looks like it was it was uh, the end of the 1930s early 1940s he started to do interviews with with veterans of the civil war which was from 1922 to 1923 um because he'd been in prison for most of that period and so he he wanted to basically to interview people to find out what happened so he could write about it more accurately um, and then the Bureau of Military History started by the Irish government it was basically which began as a proposal by Irish historians like Robert Dudley Edwards and people like that but it was effectively taken by the go- taken over by the government essentially and that they said that they would do their own project from 1913 to the which is the founding of the volunteers to um, 1920, the truce in 1921, in July 1921. Mm. Um, and so when Ernie O'Malley found out that they weren't going to cover the Civil War, he accelerated his own interviewing process. So the Bureau was one of basically a number. And then after that, there was later, there was other interview projects that followed, you know, um, some say in 1966, there was a couple in the lead up to 1966 commemorations, there was... Um, some republic some priests who interviewed republicans in the north so there was a number of them but but the bureau of military history was probably the biggest and the one that people have been and the, the most well known i guess of them and all but primarily because after the interviews were done they were done basically from 1947 to 1957 and a few more uh, trickled in after that over the next couple of years but the bulk of them were taken in those years but then the government basically um decided that they weren't going to be released uh, for a number of years and they they were eventually they weren't released until 2003 till March 2003 so part of the interest in them is that we're just now getting to read these interviews now when you're when you were going through the interviews yourself how do you think the the chronological distance between the events and the interviews maybe shaped what the participants wrote about or how they told their story well, it's impossible to get away from, really, because, I mean, because, you, you know, you're talking between 20 to, you know, 30 years since the events had happened. So so what you, they have a number of very distinct characteristics, as all as all oral history do. I mean, I think it's important to explain like that the, um, the, the Bureau of the Bureau of Military History interviews wouldn't don't resemble or you know the way a lot of oral history projects would take that would do interviews now today primarily because they don't include the questions that they ask the interviewees um so what you just get is a block of text of the person tell you know first person telling their story um and so which which in itself creates problems if you're trying to use them as history you see because then you have you know half half the conversation isn't there right mm-hmm. but having said that um what what you get is people retelling stories. First, this is very you know th- these are people who were very elderly, generally looking back on their youth. They are talking about events that that are inevitably covered by say and, and people by the fact that there was a civil war, right? So a lot of the people that they would have fought with in 1916, they would have been fighting against in the civil war. 
Then there was also another very important context was the the military service pensions legislation in 1924 and 34 that a lot of veterans are very unhappy about. So they actually use their statements, for instance, as platforms. They'll suddenly be talking about something that happened in 1921 and then they'll say, and you know, I didn't get... And, you know, I didn't get they didn't count that when I went to apply for military service pension and such and such said he was at that ambush, but he was not. And a man who was there didn't get a pension. They do things like that. And I was just wondering as well, like as you were saying, some of the interviews dealt with the Civil War. Were they supposed to or was that within the remit? Officially, no. Um, That was what the, the, the official cutoff was the truce, right, on the 11th of July, 1921. Um, and I mean, it's, it's hard now, I think, for people to understand really why they did that. But I mean, if if you think of it, the time um, and things, you know, things weren't as bad, you know, that, you know, Fianna Fáil was in government and, you know, anti-treaty eyes, pro-treaty eyes were, were working together. So it wasn't as bad as it had been in the 1920s or, you know, even the 1930s. But, you know, it was still a touchy subject. You know, people had fought together at, you know, and and fought against each other, and so that you know they were afraid that if they covered the civil war, then say for instance, uh, Fina Gaylers w- would refuse to take part in the project. You know, and so, but at the same time, you see, that, so officially it wasn't supposed to go past the remit, but they did take statements from people who did want to talk about the civil war. And the, one of the interesting things is, I mean, most of the people who talk about the civil war would have been anti treatyites because it would be, be very important to them that they be remembered and they not be uh, misrepresented. But at the same time, there there are a few, uh, you know, relatively brief but still significant um, statements that, that would deal, you know, with some degree of detail from people who joined, uh, the, the you know, the Irish Army, the National, the Free State Army it would have been at that time. Um, so, I mean, they will never be as extensive coverage of the Civil War as, say, for instance, you'd find in the Ernie O'Malley t- papers that I was talking about earlier. But at the same time, it, it you know, I th- I think sometimes it's it, it's one of the more controversial things that people s- say about the Bureau, that they didn't talk about the Civil War. So it was one of the interesting things that you find when you actually read the statements that several of them do. It's, you know, it's only, it's a minority, like, so about a couple of hundred. And, and was there evidence of much bitterness in the depositions when they were talking about the Civil War? Yeah, some people were. I mean, there's different reactions. Some people, you can see sometimes, you were asking me earlier about how, how they were in, about the distance of time. You can see sometimes veterans would say pretty negative comments about somebody, right? And that are very obviously influenced by the fact that yeah. the person, you know, he was he was a pro shite and the other person was anti shite But then you get this other reaction, though, at the same time as where it's, you know, they, they sometimes the statements have this almost dreamlike quality of how that you know these warring brothers came together in friendship at the end you know so that that in their stories they you, you try and overcome this bitterness because i mean i think you know if you put yourself back then it's one thing you know for people who weren't involved in the civil war you know like you and me to, to argue about it but if you're actually involved in it and these were you you, you know you're your friends and your, you know, your best pals or your brothers or your family who you're fighting against, it really would have traumatised you, you know. What were their feelings towards the British Army and the RIC? Well, that's another one of the interesting things because you'd ex- because it varies a lot. And I think one of the things, see, I mean, I'm lucky, like the statements are very long. There's there's 1,773 of them and some some of them are extremely long. Most of them average about... You know, about 30 pages now and it took me a year and a half to read them right but the advantage of reading them all is you get a more overall perspective and these statements you see that um, some counties are better covered than others right for instance I think there's one in Fermanagh and there's over 300 from Cork you know but at the same time because you have this regional spread and people from both sides of the political divide talking um, you get a lot of different opinions so s- some people are you know you get the standard um, you know, the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary were, you know, the arm of the British government and they were our enemies. And, you know, but then you get other people who say, you know, basically, you know, people didn't really want to shoot the RIC, you know, especially in the country. Um, and what you get, what you seem to get. Now, there were some very vicious killings of RIC men, but then you had, you see there was an, it seems to have been fairly widespread collusion among certain members of the RIC. 
of the RIC with with the volunteers and helping them and guys who just wanted to get their pensions. I mean, you have to remember that the RIC had basically, um, I, I think it was from from about 1914 or certainly during during the First World War, they had begged the British government to be disarmed. They didn't want to be armed, to, to be an armed force because they knew it would make them a target, mm-hmm. right? So, so um, the thing is, they would have had, I mean, at, on the one hand, you have RIC men who were, you know, very staunch loyalists and they really went for the IRA, right? And those are the people, some of the time anyway, that the IRA would really single out, right? But not all the time. Mm-hmm. So you have instances where they, you know, where they, where they were kind of um, being given information and not shooting people. But then side by side with that, you go someplace else and you hear, you do, you read about really vicious, pretty heartless killings of, you know. And but the other thing you get is a sense of how unpopular sometimes some of those actions were mm-hmm. among the Irish population. Well, was there a, maybe a different viewpoint towards the ordinary British soldier compared to, say, the auxiliaries or the black and tans? Absolutely, there was quite a different uh, attitude. I mean, because you, you have to remember that a lot of the of the ordinary British soldiers would have been. I mean, for a start, some of them some of them would have been Irish, even though um, the 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 wharfs would have started systematically sending out Irish troops out of Ireland. Um, and they, be, you know, because they were worried that they, be, be, because with the conscription crisis and um, the various things that were happening, that they were going to they were going to be widespread desertions. Um, but in general, you know, these guys, they a lot of them were still waiting to be demobilized for the first world war. These were ordinary soldiers. There was enormous numbers of references to them being very willing to sell their arms for instance to the Irish volunteers and even to give them information to help them raid their own barracks you have instances there's a man named Peter Monaghan in Cork who who was a who was a uh, a British deserter I think he was from Scotland as Irish parents so he he died at Crossberry but there's lots and you know but there, but there's there was lots and lots of instances also of the IRA uh, helping deserters and things like that. Now, at the same time, though, not everybody felt like that. I mean, this, you have to remember that this is like a guerrilla army. It's, you mm. know, so they can't, they, you know, GHQ, which is what you call basically the head of the IRA, it was established in 1919, um, well, or established in 1918 during the, sorry, uh, uh, during the conscription crisis, could basically advise people, but they, you know, but they didn't, you know, they had a limited capacity to make people do. A lot of the times it was local commanders who decided what happened. Mm. And so if a local commander hated British soldiers, ordinary British soldiers, then the relations wouldn't be very good. But lots of the time you hear, you know, uh, that they, you know, British soldiers helped the IRA escape. If you remember that bit in The Wind That Shakes the exactly. Barley, for instance, like that, that's based on that sort of thing happened a lot, you know. And so, but then... You know, if you were arrested by British Tommies and you just killed one of their comrades, they would beat the daylights out of the volunteers, you know. But if they hadn't, you know, you would not. I mean, there's one volunteer in particular who he, he they, they, basically people didn't necessarily get fed, right, with any regularity in the, in the prison. So a local Republican where he was imprisoned in, in Ross Commons sent in his d- dinners to this to this Republican prisoner to kind of, it was kind of a, you know, thumbing it to to basically the the British government, and so he started to share his dinner with the with the soldiers who were guarding him, and they became his best pals, you know. And so it it just so it varied a lot. So yeah, but at the same time, even though you do have these instances where, you know, there was there was a certain amount of collusion and friendliness between the you know the RAC between. Um, uh, British soldiers and even sometimes very very rarely but sometimes auxiliaries and black and tans right it's it was still very dangerous okay because there's a good few examples of very friendly RAC men who were helping the IRA who still got shot you know and British soldiers who were helping the IRA who still got shot you know so when you say that you have to be careful not to push it too far right and one, one area you would have mentioned there was uh, regional differences that would have been a a controversy after the truce that some counties maybe hadn't done their bit during the War of Independence or had been very quiet. And I'd also wonder as well, like, um, the the differences in the depositions between IRA men who would have been active in the South and those who would have been active in the area that was to become Northern Ireland as well. Um, well, 
Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I think there there is a huge uh, variation in, in the amount of uh, activities from one county in one region to the other. And there's not really just one reason for it. There's a, you know, there's several different ones. Um, I mean, the bit what 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 the volunteers would say, and certainly from the from the less active counties, uh, by and large, was that they didn't have any arms, right? And this was a big problem. Okay, even in the be- most active counties like Cork, for instance, they, there would be six hundred men in a battalion, and they'd have or in in a battalion, and they'd have twelve rifles, right? And you have to remember that. You know, say for, that what what the volunteers needed to stage an ambush was a rifle. They needed a Lee Enfield or something like that. A shotgun wouldn't do. It didn't have the range, right? A pit, you know, a, a Webley pistol or something like that. You can assassinate somebody at close range, but you can't stage an ambush. You see, so you need a certain type of of weaponry. And they were, you know, it was hard to come by for various reasons. Now, places like Cork and Dublin, where they were very well, it started to reorganize quite quickly after the Easter Rising. And they started, um, you know, attacking individual RIC men or buying guns or or soldiers and things like that. So they started getting guns early before people were really prepared, right? But as the War of Independence went on and areas that were organising later, right, they, they, you know, the RIC barracks were more reinforced. They couldn't, you couldn't really take them Um that you know, people were armed. They were prepared. They started going around in big and form, bigger formations, so it became harder and harder to get guns that way. But the thing, it, the, but GHQ's attitude, Michael Collins's attitude was, until you proved yourself, they weren't going to send you any guns. And they were saying, well, how can we prove ourselves yeah. if we don't have any guns? So you had this tug of war, and it became kind of a sizable problem. You have sometimes you, you have instances of of their own volition, people, vol- local volunteers from areas going to Britain and trying to secure arms them, themselves, and which caused could cause its own problems for GHQ if they got caught, right? Because they wanted to, to keep, you know, so there was all sorts of instances of that. That's one reason also what the volunteers uh, in some of these areas would say is that it was, you know, that it was flat. If it's flat, you can't hide, and there's lots of roads in in areas like there. But also, for instance, a hostile local, local population. If you're asking about the nor what what became Northern Ireland, uh, the volunteers operating in Belfast. I mean, they, you know, what what they would say so is that it was completely different. You were operating in a situation where about 75% of the population was completely hostile to you and if they were kind of the loyalist uh, section of that population they were actively hostile and then w- what you would also find in the north is that support for the republican movement among the among the nationalist population the catholic population was much lower than it would be in the south because most of them would have been you know in belfast they would have been supporters of joe devlin and people like that so they were in a much weaker position Right, with the, and very hostile. So, what you see is events in the north are have quite a different tra- trajectory of violence, and every you know, in all sorts of ways. I always think that's bizarre when uh, reading about the nineteen eighteen election that South Armagh would have been one of the areas where Sinn Fein would have been beaten by the the Nationalist Party, and we always imagine Sinn Fein to be a heartland of republicanism. Hmm. Well, it goes just goes to show you how things uh, have changed, you know, and so that and how dangerous it can be. You see, reading back from the say the more modern periods of trouble, post nineteen sixty nine troubles, um, back to the War of Independence, and so and certainly, I mean, I th- I think that that there's been very little research really done on the nor- the War of Independence in the North or that period in the North. Um, because certainly, for instance, for for a lot of Northern volunteers, for instance, the the Civil War was a disaster. You know, mm. now one thing that you mentioned earlier about your your BA thesis, uh, the left's role in the War of Independence and the role of the unions, uh, and also the role of some groups like the CPI and the the, the Irish Citizen Army during the Civil War. Uh, there seems to be very little coverage of the independent left's uh, role in the War of Independence. It seems to be purely a fight between nationalism and unionism. Uh, do you think there's more interest now in things like the Munster Soviets and, you, you know, the role of the Communist Party during the Civil War? Is there more interest? Um, I don't know if there's more interest. I mean, the thing is, is for certainly for my topic, you see, there's a would be relatively limited coverage of the left. I mean, there's a few left Republicans in there, right, but very few, and they ended up they're quite a marginalised group. 
you know, and they and if you like, uh, and some of them certainly would be among the more bitter, um, because they really, you know, they what they certainly their ideas of seeing themselves as being the labor arm of the Republican movement and it was going to secure something were, were tended to be quite disappointed. I mean, the th- and the thing is, is I think in the, certainly in the Bureau of Military History, there's about twenty two members of the Citizen Army interviewed, and it's it's almost all about the 1916 rising the profile of the Irish Citizen Army um, after the rising is very low right and you don't really and and a lot at least uh, several of the people uh, joined the Irish volunteers right and so it's, it was a really you know that's one of the distinctions that, that you find between the, the 1916 statements and the War of Independence statements is 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 you know you, it has quite a different sense when you read this you know the Citizen Army s- statements and the and the presence of the Citizen Army there and you s- get a certain amount of hostility sometimes mm-hmm. between the two groups. Just out of curiosity, how many of the depositions would have come from female activists? It's about a hundred, just over a hundred and fifty. Um, and about and most of those, say over two third, a little bit over two thirds of those would have been members of Come on and then there would have been several um, women from from the Irish Citizen Army. Um, Helena Maloney was was one member. She was actually the, the only female combatant who was interviewed. She was one of the people who stormed Dublin Castle, uh, and I think it was the first day of the Easter Rising. Um, but most of the rest would be, you know, from Come on and what did you find were the most interesting interviews that you came across? The most interesting interviews, well, I mean, I suppose the the bureau are are um, there. It's kind of a strange source. It's like it's like they're they're greater than the sum of our par- their parts in a way, really, because what what would strike the modern reader, right, is sometimes quite different from what the people themselves are thinking. I mean, that, that for instance, there's one group. Um, that's talked about a lot in the witness statements, the separation women who would have been the wives of Irishmen who had joined the British Army to fight in the First World War and they got what were called separation allowances while their husbands were at war. And these women would have been incredibly hostile Mm -hmm. by and large to the volunteers and so, and the volunteers hate them right back, right? Um, but the thing is, is they come across very well in the statements. It's funny they came because they're very witty and they're very tough and they're very strong and you know and so you, um, and so the way that they're actually portrayed in the statements and the way we would look at them now are quite you know are quite interesting. I mean, and I suppose one of the interesting things that I find about the statements is is just that. You know, the modesty of a lot of the volunteers, it's not, I mean, not everybody was like Tom Berry or Ernie O'Malley or, you know, they, you know, they said, oh, I was scared or, you know, one or two of them say, yeah, you know, they, they stood down from, from being the, the OC of a company or something because they didn't feel that they were military strong enough. There was one quite famous, um, or relatively famous in Dublin anyway, Joseph O'Connor, who basically, was part, who has a statement, for instance, that covers the Civil War and the end of which he talks about basically having a nervous breakdown towards the end of it. And he said, you know, and, and, and I mean, not everybody is that frank, you know, but he does. So you get an idea of the stress and the strain. And you also, one of the things I particularly like, which are, the, it's kind of their one of their distinct characteristics as an oral source rather than an, you know a more a more uh, contemporary source for the period is is the way that they tend to move from the past to the present you know when they would talk about people they would they knew as children mm-hmm. you know and then they will go right up to the interview you know say something about what was happening in 1954 whenever the interview was taken and then back to the war of independence and they they do this wonderful thing you know, they do, for instance, they if they knew each other as children, they tend to call each other, you know, say Liam Tobin, for instance, is Billy, you know, and and Sean is Jack. And so you, they, they, they have these, they use the anglicized names when they're talking about people who, if you, you know, when you read about them now, you know them by their Irish names. I remember you talking about uh, some of the interviews relating to Michael Collins' squad, that they were remarkably open about what they did. Uh, they weren't trying to say, sugarcoat the gory details. How did you find reading those? Um, well, see, I wouldn't say, see, I would say that the 
problem a little bit with the squad interviews is it's not that they sugarcoated them, but they did. There's one or two. There's by by one of the volunteers named Joe Leonard now who just it. I it's hard to understand now what he was thinking of when he did his statement, but it reads a little bit like a, a gumshoe detective novel or something. But it's very over the top and and just jokes about all these people that he killed over and over again. And it's and it's pretty. I, you know, I'm not sure how well it, it how well he comes across. I mean, the squad they, they they don't have much problem talking about killing people. Certainly, people like Vinnie Byrne. But at the same time, they 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 tend to the way they tell the story sometimes sanitizes them a little bit. I mean, this is partially because of the way the interviews were done, because they were done as a block of text that a person read over afterwards. And one of the things that happens is as they tend to clean up the language and make the sentences grammatical and all that. And that's so they, they're not very reflective of how people speak, mm. right? So that when you compare like a bureau statement from a squad member with an Ernie O'Malley interview, right, which are, that's his notes of what people actually said. So they're much rougher and they're much, and you get a much, mm. it's much more visceral experience, you know, so, and that's one of the things that can be a bit off-putting sometimes and it makes that sometimes the Bureau statements seem a little bit more disingenuous because they they lack that rawness that sometimes the O'Malley ones but um, but at the same time there's certainly an awful lot of very interesting information at them, besides that it's just something that that tendency to sanitize things is something you have to watch out for and also sometimes with their more controversial killings they just leave them out altogether. I mean, there's two there's two guys who are at Bloody Sunday who don't say it at all, mm. who just make no mention of it at all in their statements. So it's it's it you have to be careful and you have to read them in conjunction um, with you know with uh, with other works of history or other primary sources. I mean, if certainly if you're an historian, you have to use them with other primary sources. If you're just reading them out of interest, it's good to read them, you know, with with other histories. I think. And was there a lot of anger directed towards the Catholic Church, particularly from the Republican side during the Civil War? No, there. I mean, there, there's a few people who would who would give out about the the bishops' pastoral during this during the Civil War. But apart from that, what really strikes you is how Catholic everybody was and how pious they were. Now, where that comes from, it's kind of hard to know because you have to because when the interviews were done. 40s and the 50s Ireland was a much more conservative place and a much more you know and the Catholic Church was in a much stronger position then than it maybe it had been during the War of Independence so you don't know how much this is their this is their religiosity that they that you know that that, that is that they acquired subsequently or as a reflection at the time but at the same time having said that you know the the flying columns would go home or would go to mass on Sundays, right? It was one of the places, and then likely it's not the British Army waiting outside to arrest them because they knew that this was happening, or the priest would come out and give and and um, hear people's confessions and things on Sunday. So there's an office. So they they're they, they, you know the I suppose you call it the Catholicity of of a lot of the of the volunteer movement uh, is a very strong sense. So there's almost abs- I would answer your question. There's almost no anti clericalism of, say, what you'd expect to find among European uh, equivalent movements uh, at all. And is there any plan to uh, put the interviews up online? Well, apparently there are, and I think the problem is money, as far as I know, because of the current economic climate, it's going to be difficult, but there certainly have been plans afoot, and I cert- I hope they do. I mean, the, the thing is, lots of public libraries, I think it's Tipperary have put up some of their some of the statements online, and a couple of public libraries have done and so and they're making them more accessible and if they don't have the actual statements they tend to list them i mean really i think the statements are becoming probably they i think they're coming to dominate really at the moment a lot of historical representations of the, and and they're accessed by lots of people um who wouldn't necessarily be historians thank okay. you very much that was eve morrison from trinity college dublin You can check out our website on www.near.ie. Thank you for listening.